this is a mic test. If you can hear me, please vote in the chat poll. I put up a poll to see if anyone uh, can hear my mic. Great. <coughs> we will begin momentarily. Let me pull out my speaker notes and set it to size that I can read easily. All right. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, does the moderators want to say anything before we begin? No? All right. Let me set out my screens. Okay. All right. Sorry for the delay. Uh, once again, thank you and hello. Uh, I've already begun uh, sharing my slides. You should be able to see the title slide by clicking on my name and then on the join stream button. <coughs> um, I'm very excited today uh, to be able to talk to everyone all over Southeast Asia. Uh, if you can uh, hear me and see my slides, there's the post in the text chat. Um, please go ahead and vote on them just to uh, give me confidence that, yep, things are working. Yep, yep, thank you very much. I will be always keeping an eye out on the text chat. Um, if you have any, if you ever feel a need to ask me a question or if you want to share something uh, with everyone, uh, please feel free to post it on the text. Um, I have a lot to cover today, um, so I'll, I might be talking a little bit fast. If you ever need me to slow down, repeat something, or to further explain something, uh, please let me know in the text chat, and I will be more than happy to uh, do so. Um, oh yeah, sorry, Ben. Um, I I think it might have be something to do with the way my mic is set up that I might not have heard you. All right, uh, let's begin. <clears throat> Uh, let's, I'll start with a little bit of introductions about myself. Uh, my name is QJ. Uh, I'm a level 3 from Malaysia. Um, and the cat's name is Chiro. I started playing in 2001. I started being an uh, official sanctioned tournament organizer in 2007. And I started judging in 2013. Um, through the many years of, uh, of judging, I've managed to come, uh, gain a lot of experience uh, in judging and pick up a lot of uh, useful skills, including one that we'll be talking about today, which is about investigations. So what will we be talking about today? We want to talk about the basics of investigations. We want to talk about some advanced techniques that will help you uh, smooth things along in your investigations. And as well as some good practices that would help you uh, set up for success. So, what is an investigation? You can find all sorts of uh, dictionary definitions of what investigations are, but my favorite definition is to discover and examine the facts so they can establish the truth. When you encounter any particular scenario out of the ordinary, one of the first steps that everyone does automatically, either consciously or unconsciously, is to investigate. Um, something happened. Uh, what happened? What do I want to know? Your mind automatically seeks out more information to help make sense of what to do or how to react. In fact, most of the time, you're probably not even consciously aware that you did an investigation in your head. Now, how does this apply to magic? Uh, as judges, we are most interested in investigations within the context of uh, events and tournaments. And one common uh, misconception that many has is that investi investigations, uh, uh, investigations are cheating investigations. Uh, while investigations for cheating does happen, and is probably one of the more uh, prolific uh, more visible investigations. Uh, investigations are much more than just that. 
Sugen says uh, that he missed that view. Yes, yes, uh, so do I. I really miss seeing magic being played on the tables. Seeing them being played over webcams just isn't this isn't just the same. Now, why do we want to investigate? Because knowing how to investigate is relevant in tournament events of any level, even from your local uh, game stores, FNM, all the way up to the players' tour. So, I have a question for everyone. Um, I'm going to post a poll in the chat. And I would like to ask you, what do you think is the most, the primary role of a judge at the event? I believe that all these three answers are good, uh, are good answers and that you shouldn't feel wrong. Uh, you shouldn't feel bad if you disagree with someone else. That all these three are very important reasons why we uh, judges should be at the event. Um, A, to help participants enjoy themselves at the event as much as possible. B, to solve problems when it happens. Or C, to maintain the fairness and integrity of the event. Now, like I said, all three of these are very important. But I personally would argue that B and C it is ultimately to serve the purpose of the helping the participants enjoy themselves at the event, making A my personal choice. Now, again, uh, I believe all three are important. So don't feel... Don't feel bad if you feel that, if you personally feel that the another point is important because we need all these three points. So let's take a let's take a look at some examples on how um someone is. Hey, Felix. Felix, can you mute your mic? Thank you, Felix. So um, let's look at some examples on how strong investigation skills can help. Um, one of the most common ways a judge interacts with players is when a player calls for a judge. Right? You enter into an in interaction um, after a, a player calls you. Um, and while that is happening, if you have a strong investigation skill, uh, that will help you assess the situation better and be able to identify what sort of assistance that the player might require quicker. Um, this way, having strong investigation skills will help you help others um, as you are more likely to be aware that something is wrong, even when others don't see it. For example, does a player look unhappy while they're playing? Was that a card on the floor? What do you want to know before you decide to step in? Should you even step in and interrupt the game in the first place? Do you have enough, uh, good enough reasons to do so? Um, again, like I previously mentioned, a lot of this thinking is done very quickly and automatically inside your head. So why do we want to learn more about investigation? Being consciously aware of the process can help you make that process smoother, quicker, and it will lead you to more accurate and faster and decisive investigations. And how exactly are we going to do that is what we're going to be discussing today. Let me grab a drink of water. Drinking water is important. Oh, so how do we investigate? First is that you want information. You want to be able to gather the information you need. A situation exists. So what do you want to know before you decide whether or not you want to devote more time into this investigation? Two, create hypotheses. Using the information that's available to you, form an idea of what has happened, a theory on what is possible that uh, is whether what is possible but uh, to be the truth. Um, this is what we call a hypothesis. Three, verify or falsify it. Does the information collected so far convince you that your hypothesis or your idea is correct? What would change that? And then you repeat them from step one to step three until you decide to stop. Because in the process of verifying, um, you might want, if you, if you want to confirm what, what you think the hypothesis is, you might need more information. So you go back to 
Step one, gather more information to help you verify or falsify that situation. Recreate the hypothesis, does it match? Or is there a new hypothesis that you want to test out? And then you verify or falsify it again. So you repeat these three steps again and again until you decide that there's no more new information that you can get or you don't think that it's worth any more time to, uh, to find more new information and you decide to stop and come with a decision. Uh, Felix mentioned that he didn't realize that it was unmuted. No problem, Felix. No worries. It happens. Um, it happened to me. That it just happened just now as well when I didn't realize that Ben was talking. <laughs> so moving on. Let's jump straight to an uh, 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 actual scenario. You are judging in the main event of a Magic Fest. Uh, let's say GP Bangkok. Um, you are a floor judge and you are tasked to be flooring the, the floor, watching games and um, watching out for any judge calls. You're watching a match uh, and suddenly next to you, there's a judge call. Here's a good practice you should have. Um, the moment you get a judge call, take a note of the, the round time in case you need to give a time extension. So in a judge call, the player will be usually the one that gives you the initial information on what you uh, might need uh, or what you might need to know. And it turns out when you get to the table, you greet the player and you say, hi, how can I help you? And the player asks, it's, it's Ajani. And the player asks you, um, how much time is left in the round? Well, uh, I guess that's it. Case closed. Or, since you know that this is a seminar, uh, I posted a, a poll question in uh, the text chat. Was it really that simple? Is this a... Uh, okay, okay. Um, all right, all right. A lot of people are thinking that there might be something else. Um, I'm curious to know what you uh, what you think that something else is. Please feel free to share in the chat. Time to check the board state. Uh, Sugeng said, "What would you want to check for, Sugeng?" Uh, Neil says, "I, I asked what game is it." Um, uh, Sugeng wants to know who's winning. <laughs> Ron was asking if the match has finished. Um, Sugeng, yes, okay. So one of the things that you might want to know is uh, whether or not the player was, uh, 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 whether or not Ajani is trying to have a slow play or maybe his opponent is trying to have a slow play. Uh, Steven is asking about uh, game and previous game winners. Right, um, while I wait for more you know, information that... Uh, uh, more possible reasons why you want to, to ask more questions. Uh, let's say in this scenario, in this uh, example that we have, um, the TO, the tournament organizer has set up a projection of a giant round clock at the venue hall, which is exactly in front of our journey. So the step one already happened, right? We get it, we have some information. Um, we went to the table and our journey wants to know how much time left uh, in the round. However, we also know that there should be a giant clock right in front of his line of sight. Um, so step two, uh, let's create a hypothesis. Um, did Ajani not see it? Maybe Ajani didn't know about the clock? Uh, or maybe the clock is not visible or it's not working. So step three, let's verify or falsify. Um, we can look, uh, look at the round clock to verify whether or not uh, maybe it's not working. So we look at it and we see like, okay, it's, it's working fine. And it's within line of sight of, the, of our journey. So I guess this is an indicator that maybe our journey didn't know that there was a big round clock. So one way you can help our journey is by pointing at the round clock is what, what I will approach it. So I will go something like, Oh, okay, let's see now. Um, look at the round clock. We see that we have 25 minutes left in the round while pointing at the round clock. So this way, you help the player answer um, his question. Um, um, you, you help the player fulfill what he needs while at the same time informing him of where the round clock is. Uh, because you apply some investigative thinking in this particular scenario, you could help the player solve immediate concern 
and as well as not in nowhere to find the wrong uh, time for the rest of the event. Or maybe alternatively, the, you realize that while you're checking the round clock, you realize that the clock was not working. Perhaps the projector stopped working and no one noticed. So you can help Ajani, give him the round time, and then immediately after, look for the head judge or TO to uh, let them know that the clock isn't working anymore. Again, with some investigative thinking, not only you help a player, you also help a uh, contributor to helping everyone else enjoy a trouble-free event in the way that might not even be noticed by, uh, by players that uh, there was a problem in the first place. Um, checking on the chat, there are some um, interesting um, ideas. There are some interesting ideas and I'll um, um, love to uh, cover them uh, in a bit. Da, da, da. Mark says that normally I will stay put for a couple of minutes to see what's going on. Some players just want to be mindful of the time. Other than time, there's another story uh, given that I've already told them the remaining game time. Yep, um, it's always good um, to hang around after a judge call. Um, in this scenario, you want to see if, if there's any additional problems. Uh, or in, uh, in, in the rules question, you might want to see whether or not the situation that the player was asking um, actually happens and you might, you might be needed from, for example, if it's some weird interaction like, um, I wouldn't say weird, but uh, maybe something that's not intuitive like uh, spell skite and, and redirection of, of, of certain things and that a player might want to use a, the ability in a way that might not work out for him. You might want to stick around to confirm that whether or not the thing happened as it, uh, as it should be. And with that, let's move on to what we call um, risk-reward analysis. Now, what, um, bear with me uh, for a little while while I try to explain a bit on uh, this and then how it relates to investigations. So, um, it's human nature to take risks as long as the reward makes it worth it. Uh, as rational beings, um, if the cost of an action outweighs the benefits, it's very unlikely for us to, be, uh, to, to, to do it. Um, let's take cheating as an example. Uh, while teaching your younger brother who is five years old how to play magic, you realize that you're badly mana screwed and you decide to draw a few cards to fix that and hope he doesn't care or doesn't understand what the problem is. Now, one, that's very mean of you. Two, um, there's very low risk of any fallout here because um, he probably doesn't understand what is going on. One, and also the fact that uh, the reward of you being able to win against your brother is almost meaningless. So this is what we call a low risk, low reward situation. On the opposite end, you could have a player who is playing in the finals of a player's tour where winning or losing the match means a difference of 14,000 US dollars difference. So if you win, you get $14,000 more. If you lose, you lose out on that much difference. So this is what we'll call a high reward situation. But at the same time, not only there are live cameras looking at you play, there are also multiple very experienced judges who are watching you play at the same time. So this makes it very high risk if you want to cheat. So this is what I'll describe a high risk, high reward situation. So recap, a low risk, low reward situation might not be worth the effort, but it's definitely doable. A high risk, high reward situation is very risky, but if you can get away with it. Mm. So then we come to the two uh, situations, two, two end of the spectrums, that is most likely what you'll be considering in your investigations. Now, a high risk, low reward situation is very unlikely to happen because it usually involves very little benefit and could easily backfire. Um, using the Ajani example, uh, as um, some of you guys, uh, some of uh, the, the, the audience uh, pointed out in the, the text chat, uh, one of the possibilities that we might want to look out for is whether or not Ajani is stalling or his opponent is stalling. And if Ajani wanted to stall, if he wants to, to try and gain advantage by making the game feel longer, then it is a very high risk, low reward situation for him to bring attention to you how much time left in the round, unless there's some other reasons. But let's say on the surface, right, if I want to stall, 
I would want as little attention from judges as possible. And I would, uh, it would be very high risk and low reward for me to bring attention to a judge how much time is left in the round. On the other hand, a low risk, high reward situations are the, usually the ones that require a very thorough investigation to uncover. So low risk means like, is it likely to be hard to discover or is uh, very unlikely for someone to notice the problem. So those are the situations that uh, might occur uh, in, uh, in, in, in the cheating situation. But let's move on to another uh, example to help illustrate to further illustrate what we just talked about. So um, in this new scenario, you're in the same event as we were at earlier. Um, you're again on the floor watching GP Bangkok, uh, watch, uh, watching games at GP Bangkok. You finish watching a game wrap up and started looking for another match to watch. And then you notice that Chandra was playing against Teferi. Now, it's not very obvious and it doesn't look like she's very angry or upset, but there's definitely a mix of annoyance and agitation. She doesn't look very happy. So you decide to investigate. Step one, let's see if there's any reasons for us to get involved. Let's get some information. So you go to the table. Um, you look like, it looks like Chandra is playing mono red, obviously. And Teferi is playing blue-white control, obviously. Chandra, doesn't, Chandra only has a single card in her hand, while Teferi is holding a pretty full hand of cards. So let's create a hypothesis. Let's think about what's the possibility. Um, we can start with the simplest one. Uh, Chandra is just waiting for her turn, and she's bored. However, there's always the possibility that Teferi is uh, committing slow play. So, how can we verify this or to falsify this? Step 3. We watch them play. If Teferi plays at a reasonable speed for the next few turns, um, we can find a different table, or we can keep watching this table just in case the game slows down again. If we feel that Teferi is indeed playing too slow, then the possibility of stalling exists. Now, um, just a quick recap on stalling and slow play for those who are not familiar with IPG, the Infraction Procedure Guide. Slow play is, as the name implies, um, it's an infraction for someone who plays too slowly and carries a warning. Stalling is playing slowly on purpose in order to gain an advantage, which carries um, a, a penalty of disqualification because um, that's what we consider a form of cheating. You're trying to use the time to your advantage. And usually what this means is if they are one game up or the game being a draw is in their favor, they might want to end an unfavorable game by, into, by dragging the time into a draw, depending on the situation. So now we change our hypothesis. Maybe Teferi is stalling. How can we verify or falsify this? To verify or falsify this, if Chandra is up a game, then Teferi would have no reason to want to stall the game. In fact, it will be in his benefit to finish the game earlier so they can have a third game in order to win the match, assuming that a match draw is not a goal. So in this scenario, we, we ask the players uh, and we find out that yes, Teferi is, in, is indeed uh, down a game. And at this point of the time, he's, he's struggling to survive the game because he's on very low life and Teferi uh, is very likely to, to, to lose if uh, China managed to find a burn spell. And very likely in this scenario that Chandra is just having, uh, is just being bored and impatient. At the same time, you also notice that the players are playing at the low tables and are very late rounds in the GP. So the players are not no longer playing for anything significant other than for the match win. So in this high risk, low reward situation, you find it very unlikely for Teferi to be stalling. However, this does not excuse Teferi for playing slowly. So you probably should match him along and issue slow play warnings when uh, needed. So by investigating and identifying this to be a very low reward situation uh, for Teferi, well, uh, the risk is debatable, um, and it really depends on the exact situations and the cards involved, but I'm personally comfortable with putting aside the possibility of stalling in this scenario. Um, we're approaching the 25 minutes mark. Do you guys need a break? Does anyone need like five minutes break or anything? Or should we continue because we have um, we have quite a bit of things to cover. So just a quick yes or no. 
If anyone feel like they need a few minutes, uh, we have a continue from wins. Mm. Wait, because um, I promise you, scenario four is the most interesting, and you will enjoy that the most. So let's quickly move on. Here's another tool that you could help you um in your uh, investigation arsenal. Um, what we call negate your hypothesis. So it's, it's something that we have already done in the past few uh, examples. <clears throat> like instead of trying to prove what your hypothesis is, how you're trying to verify it, consider what would make you, uh, what would uh, falsify, what would negate it? What would change my mind? This, um, in a more complicated scenario, unlike the examples that um, we've, we've talked about so far, um, when you're, when, when it's more complicated and there's more factors to consider uh, or it's very much more unsure, when you get stuck on whether or not you, how to prove or reject the situation, try approach it from a different uh, angle. What would change your mind? Uh, this helps you open up space to consider other possible information that you might not have considered. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let me just get a bit more water before we move on to the next example to help uh, signify this. Here's a third scenario. Once again, you're working at the GP, uh, but now you're helping the deck check team. During the deck check, um, uh, on a random deck check, you you're checking Jay's deck. And you notice that 21 out of the 23 lands that Jace is playing in his deck has the same consistent marking on the same corner of the sleeves. I put a poll in the text chat. Do you think Jace marked his sleeves on purpose? It's just for fun, nothing serious. Just go on and... Um... <laughs> <clears throat> just something a little bit fun for my end. So, from what you've gathered so far, you feel pretty convinced that, yeah, I think this looks really bad for him. Uh, you, you feel that, it, you, you feel fairly certain that Jay's probably marked his sleeves on purpose to get an advantage, but you're unsure on how to verify or, or prove it. So, um, you decide to talk to Jay's. Jace tells you that um, earlier, before this, he was cautioned by another judge and told him that his sleeves look very worn out and that he should change them. So he bought a new pack of sleeves, he tells you, from a vendor in the venue, and he changed it between the last round and this round, um, earlier this round, uh, with Gideon, his friend, who helped him sleeve up his cards as well. Um, because the time was rounds was very short, they rushed to sleeve it up, so um, is that a problem, judge? In order for your hypothesis to be false, what Jace have told you must be true. So in order to prove the hypothesis, you could, one, ask uh, which judge uh, told him to change the sleeves. Uh, ask which judge to, show, uh, to show, um, ask which judge cautioned him. Uh, maybe he can identify it by name or by looks. Some, you know, we have name tags. So hopefully maybe Jace remembers, um, or if not, get a physical description of it so we can have a guess uh, on uh, which judge was it, and we can find that judge to confirm it. Two, uh, find out which vendor that he bought it from, and we could confirm with the vendor. It's um, if everyone, all the vendors are selling the same type of sleeves, it might be difficult, but sometimes um, certain vendors are the only ones that brought a certain type of sleeve, so maybe that would help. Three, um, find an, and ask Gideon if he indeed helped uh, Jace to sleeve his cards. If, even if, uh, so I admit that even if all three of the above is true, there's always still the possibility of Jace marking his cards intentionally. But while you're investigating all three points above, if any of the situations mentioned was found to be false, if the vendor says he never had, I never sold those sleeves. If the uh, the vendor is the only one that that carried the sleeves, if the judge that he managed to identify said no, I have never done that, or if Gideon said no, uh, I I've never helped him with his sleeves, then you can feel more certain about Jace marking his sleeves on purpose because it's very likely Jace lied to pretend to be innocent. 
Um, uh, just quick look at the chat. Uh, Sugi asks, is it happening on other sleeves? Okay, uh, I think Ben is uh, already answered that question. Um, I'm referring to just only the lens, the 21 out of the lens, the sleeves on the lens uh, have a, a consistent marking. Yep, uh, Ben is correct in the fact. Uh, Felix says, if it's uniform with all the sleeves, there's not much need to investigate if it's Uzalan so fishy. <laughs> uh, Joel is asking that uh, uh, Jay should be buying new sleeves. Yeah, yeah. So, um, for this scenario, uh, we managed to confirm everything that Jay told you. Um, and you also discovered that the remaining of the sleeves that Jay's didn't use in the deck also have the same markings in the same corner of the sleeves. So it looks like it's um it's a, probably a manufacturing defect that caused the markings on all the sleeves in the same pack. So with that, you feel more comfortable ruling out cheating. However, this is still a mark cut situation. It's an infraction um uh, that carries a, a warning a penalty usually, but because there is a um, if it's an upgrade clause, there, there's a potential for a person to identify, uh, be able to gain advantage from those markings. You will give uh, Jace a game loss. At the same time, you want to educate him to uh, remind him to shuffle his cards and his sleeves before sleeving them to avoid patterns like this in the future. All right. I you, hope you're ready. We're going to be talking about the big one. Once again, you're on the floor. Uh, at the GP and two players are having an argument. Uh, they are arguing really loudly and it caught your attention. You quickly make your way to the table and you find Liliana and Garo. They are arguing. And we're gonna, before we get too deeply into this, let's talk about two practices that you might, uh, it's good to have uh, at this, uh, in scenarios like this. Now, we as judges have to be fair, right? We have to be, we have to treat all parties equally and fairly. Uh, but the key point here is that sometimes it is not so obvious to people. And that the key point here is that we need to provide the perception that we are being fair and biased. Uh, we are being fair and not biased. Uh, when you get to a table, and in this situation, um, in this example, Liliana quickly tells you the, the story that tells you that there's a problem and that Garuk is not talking uh, anything. So it's important when this sort of things happen, it's important to gently stop them and also let the other person speak his point of view as well. Um, make sure that they are given the chance to also voice their side of the story and pay them as much attention as you did the other player. So in this scenario, again, Liliana is doing all the talking. After you, you feel that you have, uh, in, uh, when for this scenario, Liliana started talking about how, what Garuk is doing instead. So you could gently remind her to, um, hang on, I, I, uh, I would like to hear what Garuk has to say as well. And then get Garuk's side of the story. Um, Mark in his, uh, in the chat asks, theoretically, this will take a lot of time to confirm all the data. How would you know? If you're taking too much time in investigation and make a decision, uh, you're referring to the deck check situation, right? Um, in in all investigations, um, they'll always be taking time, and you always have to evaluate how much time you want to invest in a particular uh, investigation. Uh, and the more likely you feel that something is really untoward, the more time that you want to to put in uh, into the investigation. Um, <clears throat> it's very hard to answer this question because uh, the answer, the best answer I can give you is it depends, and I really hate that answer myself. Um, but I will be um, towards the end of this seminar. There will be a session about um, ending the investigation, and hopefully that will give you a bit more uh, insight on how you should and how and when you should be ending an investigation and how to move forward uh, in, in, in any uh, potential situations like that. Um, uh, after that, if you, after, after see that mark, if you feel that you have even more questions you want to ask me, uh, I'll be more than happy to, to answer you. 
So uh, like we said, in this scenario, we want to give Liliana and Garu both equal attention and to make them feel heard. The second thing I want to talk about before we move into uh, the, the, we dive deep into the situation is um, there's a danger of having each player's statements, what they say, contaminate each other. Now, in this situation, we, we notice that uh, it's quite obvious to us that there, there is a conflict. Um, there is a, a disagreement on what actually happened. Um, in conflicts that exist, a danger of a player's statement being contaminated when the other person is hearing. Like, you know that what Liliana and, uh, said happened and what Garut said happened did not match up. If you let both players listen to each other talk about the situation, um, it might contaminate the, the statements you get uh, from, uh, from both sides. One person, one of them, or maybe both of them may choose to add or remove details depending on what the other person said. So, what's the solution? It's always good practice to proceed to interview the players individually the moment you discover that they have contracting uh, statements. And I would always, <coughs> excuse me, I will always start with the person that made the error. Um, start with the player that made the mistake or broke the rule because if the person did it on purpose, this will give them less time to come up with a story to justify it or try to get away with it. Even if they are not doing it on purpose, you know, it is a, uh, it's a good precaution against it if it, if it is happening. Um, have the player talk to you on the table while sending the other player away. The reason here is that in a complicated board position, for example, you might want them to be able to show you what, uh, what uh, move the objects around, what they think happened, refer to items, objects on the, on the battlefield or in other zones, on uh, what actually happened, uh, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So knowing all this, let's dive back into the scenario. Uh, I hope you're ready. Uh, before we dive back in, another sip of water. And a look at the chat. Uh, Joel, asks, uh, no, Joel says that it will always be a good advice to tell the players to get new sleeves. I believe it tells the message that you are not saying the player is cheating, but rather his sleeves are worn out. Yep, definitely good advice. All right, are you ready? I think I'm ready. All right, here's how the battlefield looks like. Garuk has uh, scavenging wolves with three Pasan Pasan counters. Uh, Barhai throat uh, with a Pasan Pasan counter on the battlefield. And this is how his core pad looks like. On the other side, Liliana has a tapped Spawn of Mayhem. As well as the live totals being like this. So, when you talk to Liliana, uh, she claims that uh, Garuk has never activated his scavenging ooze and should not have the three person person counters, and that he should be at four life, uh, just like what uh, her score sheet says. When you talk to Garuk, however, he tells you that yes, he definitely did use it three times, and that. Liliana must have wrong, marked the wrong side of the score pad because she should, she should be at one less life than she said it is. So let's take a look at their, the score pads. On the left is Garuk's, on the right is Liliana's, and you can see there's indeed there is one less life uh, uh, on Garuk's side of Liliana. So we know that there's this disagreement, disagreement. We quickly separate the players. And we want to take a deeper look in the situation to gather more information, step one, uh, so that we know what are the questions that we want to ask. What exactly is the situation? What is the hypothesis that we want to come up with? Now, there's a lot of things going on at the same time. We haven't even looked at the rest of the battlefield. And um, this seems like very complicated and it's a big mess. But the key situation here is always be calm and always take things, take things one at a time. We know that there's issues with uh, life totals discrepancy um, and also whether or not the ooze was activated. Now, the ooze activation with plus one plus one counters probably means that uh, life game was involved because if it wasn't a creature card, there won't be a plus one plus one counter and there won't be a life game. So we know that the key information that we'll need 
depends on the life totals. So we examine the score pairs. So let's start there. This, uh, the score pairs will be the one that will give us the most clue uh, on what's actually happened. And this is uh, exactly the reason why we encourage players to use pen and paper to record their lives, because otherwise um, we are more likely to believe the person who did rather than the person who didn't. So always encourage your players to be using pen and paper or any other way of uh, recording live totals that has uh, that you will be able to track differences. Now again, remember, keep calm. Let's take things one at a time and closely examine the score pads. Do you see it? There are two inconsistencies. The first point one is here. It looks like one, Liliana took one less damage than Garut thought she did. Now, we're not sure what could have possibly caused this, but it does not seem related to the ooze since um, there's no life gain on Garuk's side, and that uh, that's not this is not the thing that uh, Garu is uh, is uh, Garu and Liliana are arguing about. Then there is this and this. There's three life here gained over uh, by Garu over two instances. This is probably the three activation. What we think is the three activation of the ooze that are being argued about. Now, um, the first situation is a lot more, is, is much more of a mystery to us, but it's a much more smaller change compared to the second set. So let's start there. Now that we got this information from the table, uh, let's talk to the players. Who do you think we should interview first? Um, the, put out a poll question in the chat, just for fun. Who do you think that we should be interviewing? Now, uh, remember, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we want to interview the player who made a mistake so that if the player was doing it on purpose, we have less time to formulate a story. However, in this situation, we don't know whether or not Garu actually did make a mistake. Um, but since there's not much going on. Uh, there's so much going on on Garuk's side of the board that we decide to talk to him first because uh, even though we don't know whether or not we're sure whether or not he did a mistake, uh, whether or not he actually did a mistake, um, things are happening on his side. So we start with him. So we talk to Garuk and we ask, what do you think happened here? So he might think that you want to talk about the Wu situation, but you tell him that I'm, I'm really curious about here. There's a very big swing here. What do you think? Well, what happened here? What do you do? You remember? Uh, it's an eight point swing. So I'm sorry. It's a seven point. It's a seven damage swing. So it's probably a very big attack. And Garu tells you that he doesn't remember and that it must have happened very early on in the game. It's marked very early up, uh, up in the point of the, the score sheet. I, I can't remember. So, we go through the graveyard to see whether or not there's anything that uh, could contribute to the damage. And we see a look at Liliana's graveyard. And then we look at the score pad again, since uh, Garu is not being very helpful. And we notice that there is a very rare instance of a life gain on Liliana's side. Now, what could I possibly cause it? Is it because of this? So we ask. Yep, Ben. Uh, ben got it right. There's a Black Lance Paragon that is a very effective blocker because it gives Death Touch and Life Link um, to a Flash creature uh, on a Flash creature. So you can give it to any knight, and uh, usually you can use it on himself. And so we ask uh, Garu. Is it possible that uh, this is, is caused by this? And he says, oh, okay, now I remember. And he tells you how the first three turns went. So I went turn one Pelt Collector. This is what he says, he tells you. And then I cast a turn two Scavenging Moves. So the Pelt Collector gets a plus one, plus one counter. And then I attack for two with uh, the Pelt Collector. And then on my turn three, I mutated Gem Razor onto the Pelt Collector and attack for, uh, mm, I think, 7 damage. So that's why she went down to 11. Oh, but 
she has a a, a paragon. She flashed it in, and then uh, it blocked the gem razor. So that would be five five block by three one trample four damage. Uh, that's two damage from the ooze. Uh, six. Oh, okay, okay. I, 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 I okay. I see. I, I see my mistake. Um, it should be six damage, not seven. And then she gained uh, three life. All right. I guess I made a mistake. And then when we talk to Liliana. She described the situation exactly as uh, Garup says, with the more correct uh, situation. It, it correlates to to what uh, what we've talked about so far, but with the correct damage instead of the wrong one. So, what's our hypothesis? At this point, it seems likely that Garup honestly forgot to count the one toughness that it was blocked, uh, that it was a careless mistake. Um, using the, t uh, the, the, the techniques that we talked about earlier on about negating our idea, let's flip the idea around. Let's flip the hypothesis around and imagine Garuk doing it on purpose. Now think about the risk-reward analysis. Um, for me personally, it feels like a very low to medium reward situation. One life might matter in the long run, especially uh, with the spawn of mayhem. But at this early point of the game, it might not make it much of a difference. But then again, the game goes out very fast, so that at one point might happen. So for me, it's a very low to medium reward situation. Um, but however, in my opinion, it is also a very high risk because such a big combat swing is quite easily identifiable and um, it's, it's easily traced. Uh, we, we can we, even we could notice it after going through the, the score pads and looking through the graveyard and like, like, hmm. Uh, it's very likely there's this situation. So even uh, we managed to convince, we managed to get Garuk to tell us that, okay, this is the situation that it happened and I made a mistake. Um, so while it is definitely debatable, I would consider this a high risk, low to medium reward situation and find it highly unlikely for Garuk to be doing this on purpose. And before we uh, dive in deeper to the second part of the discrepancy, there's one more point that I want to bring up. That misremembering something does not mean that the person is lying. When you're lying, when a person lies, it has intent. You want to, 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 to hide something. Right? A person can misremember or misunderstood, misunderstood details in a situation but still be able to speak with conviction on what they feel happened. So memories degrade very quickly, especially um, for us, more relevant to us in the tournament, especially in the GP where it's very long day. Um, people get exhausted, you play a lot of games, you're, you're tired, you might be stressed out, you might not be having a good day, and then things just, you, you just forget things. Now, in this situation where Garou is playing against Liliana, it's round six, uh, it might be a heated match, the players doesn't seem to be to like each other very much, and that might have contributed to, uh, stress to both players. Just a person, just because a person um, cannot remember or misremember something doesn't mean that they're lying to you intentionally. So don't persecute a player for remembering the wrong facts. However, if, on the other hand, if someone keeps conveniently forgetting all the information that you expect them to have, that might be a factor that you might want to consider in your investigation. <laughs> like Ben uh, mentioned in the chat, he suddenly remembers everything. Yeah, yeah, um, conveniently, yes, but not impossible. So, like I said, take into account um, what the potential impact, what is the benefit for, the, for a person to be lying and uh, whether or not you think that person, if he indeed is lying, is it really worth it? Now back to the battle. Now that we solved the first issue, let's talk about the second issue. How are we going to solve this? Uh, okay, before we get uh, dive into that, Joel has another thing to share. Joel says, as an aside, please do not assume in a match with life discrepancy when a player has a life pet and the other person has a dice that the life pet guy is correct. Yes, 
uh, that is true. Uh, it's just that when you, uh, that's, that's actually very really correct. Uh, but it's definitely having a life pack will give you more information than the other person. And that, uh, that is something that you can put into your consideration as well. Let me just get some bit more water. Oh, um, uh, like Ben said, is uh, there's a need to remind people to use live pads, and also if you're if you're running a competitive IRL event, it is actually um a requirement in the MTR now. Yep. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go back to this. Now, uh, whether or not Garuk has activated the ooze. Now, um, the first thing that we can assume um, is probably Garuk is lying, right? Uh, maybe he needs the extra damage. Maybe he needs a five fire attacker because um, the bot as a as a as a, as a mono grid ego is kind of a bit sad on on his end if he only has a two two and a three three. So let's assume that he was lying that in that he sneaked in the person person counters even though he might not have been able to like for example if he didn't have enough mana or didn't have the chance to or he forgot. Uh, so we start by interviewing Garuk. He tells you, uh, of course, keep these things in your head. Don't say it out loud that uh, you think that Garuk lied. <laughs> Um, otherwise, um, uh, things might not be good for you. Um, it's another topic entirely that we can uh, probably talk about another sem whole seminar about. Uh, so we won't get into that at this time. Uh, we start by interviewing Garuk. He tells you, look, I don't remember which turn exactly I activated them, but I can show you when I gain life from them. And then, look, look at those cards. Those are the cards that was exiled, right? That's the, the, the three cards, and that's the three cards that the Ooze ate. Besides, look, I have a questing beast in my hand. It's my turn. She has no untapped blockers. I'm gonna win, even without the plus one plus one counters on the Ooze. She only has five life, you know, she has like, what, six life now? But, you know, I have more than enough damage. So, so far, everything seems check out. There's nothing seems. The, nothing seems too terribly wrong about the things that he said. There's nothing that you could try to disprove. So we move on by uh, talking to Liliana and that with a new assumption, uh, a new hypothesis, maybe Liliana's lying. Maybe Garuk did activate those Wu's activation, but she never purposely, uh, she never actually uh, write it down because she wanted to assume that it didn't happen. Again, keep the hypothesis in your head. It's just something that we work on in our head. It's not, it doesn't necessarily mean that you believe that it's true. It's just a theory that you want to test out. So we talked to Liliana. You don't remember what, uh, you don't remember Garuk activating his ooze at all? No, nope. um, she said. I don't remember that she did. he did. I'm pretty sure he didn't, in fact. Um, so if that is true in our head, we, we think, then shouldn't there be the there shouldn't be cards as exiled. So let's ask about it. Why do you think these cards are exiled and what we assume to be exiled because they're sideways at the graveyard? Like, I don't remember, uh, she said. Maybe Garuk turned them sideways when I was paying attention. She was he wasn't being very talkative, he was all uh mostly grunting and uh, <laughs> so how do you think he managed to put those person person counters on the Usen that you that it, it, I find it, you say to her that I find it a bit hard to um, imagine how those person person counters could be placed there without you noticing. And obvious, um, as expected, she started be, uh, Liliana is a bit more uh, upset right now and says, look, I don't remember, okay? I was too concerned about making sure that I could win the following turn. So I was mostly focused on that. Oh, okay. So um, how are you going to win? Uh, can you show us? And Liliana shows you her hand. So she has eliminate and another black lens in her hand. And he, she tells you, I'm planning to eliminate his ooze anyway. Um, so why would I want to lie about the plus one person counters? In fact, 
In any case, if he has the three extra life, my black lance will be able to deal the extra damage. Of course, she doesn't know that. Uh, we know that uh, Garot has a has a uh, questing beast, so her plan is not going to work. But obviously, they some most time most of the time, um, players are not going to assume all the possible uh, possibilities in the game. Uh, uh, the really pro players could, but uh, let's just say for this example, Lilena didn't think about that. So, uh, there is where, uh, let me just take a quick look at the chat. Boon, uh, Kit says, uh, I feel like Garuk's life pack write more details that can find more evidence in board graveyard and maybe their memories. <laughs> yep, um, and we're going to examine it uh, even more further. Uh, we already examined through the, to the, the score pads. Now let's uh, examine um, the player's line of thought. Uh, here's a, a point of consideration that uh, I would invite everyone to put into consideration when you're investigating. Um, magic players usually have very clear plans on how you want to play the game in order to win. Right? You build a deck, you, your deck has a plan. If your uh, Thermal Reclamation, um, it's, it's, it's gone now, but uh, Thermal Reclamation, you, know, you want to drop your lands, you want to... Uh, build up to the enchantment and then you want to uh, explosion people with uh, a lot of cards and you can keep doing that. You have a plan and as the game goes on with the cards that you have, you make plans based on those and how you move towards your goal of winning the game. When a player, when someone acts irrationally or their plan actions, as in the, the, the sequence of actions that they are planning doesn't make sense or and, and or um, if their plan relies heavily on the mistake, the situation that we are investigating, so if, if an, uh, a mistake happened and that they needed that mistake to have happened, that's where the warning bells comes ringing. You know, your, your spidey sense should be tingling that, that if the plan and the sequence of actions doesn't make sense, I would very much like to be uh, looking more deeper into it. So if Garuk was relying on the Ooze to win, I would have been more skeptical. If Liliana had no way to deal with the Ooze, I will be examining the things that she said, uh, and I'll be asking her how does she plan to deal with the Ooze uh, in the near future. Now, in this particular situation, both players are convinced that they're going to win soon, and the Ooze, while not insignificant, is, is definitely a, is either a 2-2 or 5-5, five, five, so that does make an impact on the board. I'm not saying that it doesn't. However, it doesn't make or break the situation entirely open uh, for either players. Uh, uh, and it, it doesn't, it's, it's not a, a key, it's a, it's a small bump in their plans, but it's not exactly a big road bump that uh, we would want to uh, examine, be more skeptical about. So we go back to the hypothesis, right? Let's wrap up. The first, Hypothesis that we have was that Garou was lying. The board situation seems clear. Um, the exile cards, the life counters, the life changes. You know, you, you, you feel inclined to, inclined to believe in Garou. Liliana doesn't have a very good uh, explanation on how she could have missed her cards being moved, you know, being turned sideways to be exiled, or how she missed the plus one plus one counters. So she didn't manage to convince me that Garou was lying. So we're going to throw away the first hypothesis. Second hypothesis is that Liliana is lying. While she doesn't, while not remembering the circumstances, feels suspicious, uh, you could tell that it doesn't really matter much to her. Her plans and her logic on how she's going to play the rest of the game is sound. And also, using the risk-reward consideration, it seems unnecessarily high risk to me that she would want to bring attention to argue whether or not the ooze was activated. If she already have the answer in hand, uh, and also the fact that it is very difficult to defend the stance uh, of, um, of of trying to lie her way into making the Ooze lose three person person encounters, um, it's very high risk to me, Tim, in my opinion. It's uh, it seems like something that you cannot really be able to convince people that it actually does happen if you think about it. So. Uh, since she doesn't rely on the ooze being on 2-2 being the win, the reward of having the ooze become a 2-2 instead of 5-5 is also middling at, uh, at most to me. So with high risk, middle reward, 
it doesn't really make sense for me that she's lying here as well. So we move on to the third hypothesis that the possibility that Garu was being unclear, they weren't communicating, and that Liliana honestly missed them. So turns out, uh, after we asked a few more questions, we also discovered that, again, um, they haven't been announcing life total changes and they have very minimal verbal exchange before uh, arguing. So in this situation, I would be convinced that Garou was correct. I would leave the counters on the ooze and have the, continues, uh, have the players continue playing and also a, C, a communication policy warning for uh, both of the players to educate them on how they need to verbally announce and confirm life total changes for both players. Now, I'm already out of, um, already past the one hour mark. So let's, uh, the last two points before we wrap up um, the, the uh, seminar. One, um, talking about how to end the investigation. Knowing how to terminate the investigation is very important. To keep things uh, simpler, and also easier to digest the scenarios that we've been discussing the whole day. I mean, the, in the past hour has been um, uh, has uh, given you convenient in quotation marks convenient information on how to help you reach a conclusion. Um, in reality, that information might not come easily. Sometimes it is just not possible to verify or falsify your hypothesis with absolute certainty. So after all. Um, you were not there when it happened. And very often, you only have statements from other people to base your decisions on. So avoid running in circles. At a certain point, trying to get more information will cost you too much time for something that might have too little impact on your hypothesis. Um, this is why having a plan and putting into consideration all the things that we've talked about today can help you avoid running uh, in circles to try to get information that you might not be able to find. While maintaining event integrity is important, if you consume too much time, it's also detrimental to the tournament as everyone else's tournament experience will suffer in the case uh, where there's a long tournament delays. So when it becomes too long and that no information is forthcoming, it is time to end the investigation. So, oh, um, Phoenix, uh, thank you for the check-in for about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, but I think I would be able to finish in maybe about five minutes. So this is like the last few, uh, last few bits. Uh, last point that I want to make is, um, just a bit uh, to share. This is not investigating per se, but, um, when you finish your investigation, here's some good practices on how to deliver those decisions. Uh, at a point, the best thing you can do is to make a decision based on what you feel is most likely. Uh, be aware that as a key part of the process or the investigation process, because you keep testing your hypothesis, you might end up doubting your idea more than you started with. Uh, don't let that slow you down. Don't let that make you feel bad. Um, regardless of all those things, it's the one that you will have to stick with because it was most likely the one that you tested on the most. Uh, before you announce a decision, build in a summary thing in your head. Um, summarize the things that, all the key information uh, that led you to this point. Um, think about what you want to say in your head because the better you are at delivering your decision, the easier it is for your decision to be convincing and also easier to accept. If you think about what you want to say clearly in your head first, before you deliver it, it's gonna be uh, much more convincing and it will come out easier it, rather than if you stammer through your, um, your, your, if you stammer and you hum and haw while explaining why you made the decision, that is not gonna be very convincing. Um, one way that I'll do it is I'll explain how, what information has, uh, has deproved all the other theories, what this information supports that theory, and then you deliver that, in that decision. You educate, you penalize and fix if there's any, and ask the players to continue on if there's still any games to finish. Those who end up with a more unfavorable position due to your decision will almost definitely object. 
don't try to restart the investigation. You already spent a very exhaustive amount of time to get to this point. So any new information that the player might try to bring up should have been brought up earlier. Um, Joel shares uh, that in the investigation, uh, the players are asking someone who did not see what actually happened make a decision. That's right. So we wrap up. We've talked about the basics on investigations. We talk about the risk reward analysis. Um, if you if you were at the the if we ever meet in person, it, this is this is a a, a a really weird story that I've t I think I told some uh, people in uh, in uh, who's attending um, about <laughs> risk versus reward. Um, it's very hard to explain in text and also to to talk uh, online. And it's definitely a lot more interesting to talk in person. If we ever had a chance to meet in person, remind me to tell you about uh, this story. Sorry for teasing you about that. <laughs> but it's an extra incentive for you to come find me and talk to me. Uh, we also talk about how to uh, uh, negate your falsify your hypothesis can help. We talked about the importance of providing the perception of fairness and the dangers involved with statement contamination as well as how misremembering something does, ne does not necessarily mean that they're lying. We talk about how and when you think uh, to end the investigation and how, uh, what are the good practices involved in delivering the, the decision. And that wraps up uh, my seminar. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me now, here, or uh, even in private later. Um, sorry for running a bit over time. Uh, I hope that this has been an interesting uh, seminar for everyone. It was definitely very interesting for me to make, uh, coming up with the Garut versus Liliana situation from scratch, as well as animating the slides. Uh, has, um, it, 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 was a, it was something last minute. Uh, if you ask Felix, uh, no, not Felix, uh, Ben. Ben and Steven, uh, when they were checking my, my slides, um, I haven't put that up. Uh, and then I decided like, hey, this isn't very clear. And I decided to uh, yesterday to <laughs> to rush in those slides. I think I added probably 15 slides with a lot more animation than the rest of the slides put together in order to illustrate the Garut versus linear situation. It was a lot of work, um, but uh, I think it was very worth it. I hope, I hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, Checking the chat. Thank you, thank you, thank thanks to you uh, for listening. Thank you for uh, for chiming in in the polls as well as in the text chat. I really appreciate all of the comments. And if there is no questions, um, <laughs> yes, uh, 